Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 331. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're honored to have with us the internationally celebrated and award-winning children's book author and illustrator, Ashley Spires. Hello. <laughs> so Ashley. nice to be here. I yes. Have to, that's a big title. I have. There's a lot for me to live up to. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, you are internationally acclaimed and you are award winning. So, yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you do this, it's just what's what's next, right? It's always just what's next. What What's on right. the plate? What do I have to do? Best to look forward, not so back so much. But yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And so is it true? So you you have to your name, is it, I, and I'll make sure I got this number right 43 distinct books that you've you have what? either illustrated I like more than I would have thought, <laughs> but <laughs> I thought I was in the thirties, but, but it could be, but also the one, some of the books you've illustrated too, as well. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. With the yeah. ones I've illustrated too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's been busy. <laughs> it's, been, it's been busy. Yeah. Been busy. So I have a, a nine-year-old and I have a, a, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old daughters and I got a three-year-old son. They brought home a couple of your books and I, <laughs> So the best part about it, and this is, the, and, and we can go into details about this as well later, is that the a lot of people don't understand how difficult it is to write and illustrate a children's book. Binky the Space Cat was the, the book that she first read, and I, and I yeah. fell in love with that. And and that was one of your first books that you came out with mm -hmm. before. It was shortly after Penguin and the Cupcake, correct? Yes. It was a happy accident. <laughs> I feel like that book was a happy accident. Not not in in terms of, um, you know, I really was so sure I was going to be, uh, well, and am, um, a creator of picture books. And, you know, this was, you know, well, not quite 20 years ago, but coming up on it, um, 15 years ago, I guess. And, um, but working on it, of course, a couple of years before that. And I pitched it as a picture book. And my editor at the time, you know, at that point, there was maybe Baby Mouse and not a whole lot else in terms of junior graphic novels. And she was the mm. one who said, this concept's great, but what about doing a junior graphic novel, which I, um, was like, oh, that sounds great. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> and she's like, great. Neither do I. <laughs> so, so the two of us walked into it blind. And I think that's probably a really good way to do this, these things sometimes because, you know, you just go on instinct and it's none of the like, I'm going to look at what other people have done. Not that I mean, that's great. And it has helped me doing that. But this was, you know, this whole entire book was just just instinct and just trying to tell a story with um in the graphic format for kids mm. that's engaging and getting to add in the jokes that i wanted to add in and uh that you can't sometimes fit in a picture book right like the little fart right. jokes and stuff like that the little the things right. that have to be you know sequential to land the joke you've got the sequence so you can you can kind of yeah it just it opened up another avenue of uh, storytelling to me that i previously had never thought of because again because i'm so old um growing up you weren't allowed to read comics and you know like we were in the 80s you're not allowed to read comics in elementary school so um i was blown away that you could do that now and so right. it was uh, yeah it was a happy accident but it, it hit the mark and it's still going strong all these years later and, and has had other lives right it's um you know it's a it's a box set now, which is kind of cool. Right. That just came out. Um, there's seven books in the series, and then there's three seasons of uh, Agent Binky on on Treehouse and television up here. So, and, and so what I when I what I love about your work, what makes it distinct to other children's book authors and artists, is that there is a distinct character of perseverance based purely off of innocence and drive. Yeah. Is that something that you've also seemed to kind of gravitate more towards having this overall theme of perseverance for all your characters? Um, first off, thank you. That is really high praise. No, really, that's, I, I love that that's what you get from my books that, you know, I did my job then. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think it was intentional. I think when it comes to me anyway, when it comes to writing a story, there's always going to be a part of me in it. And if there isn't, mm. kids can smell it from a mile away, right? They know inauthenticity. And it took me a while to sort of sort out the right, way of mining my own experiences and making them palatable for children and connecting with them. And I think that honestly, that's just something that I 
I, it's a, it's a part of me. There's a, a certain amount of definitely drive is a huge part of, of me, but um, mm -hmm. also just that like kind of hopefulness and, and wanting people to be kind and, and, belief in kindness and innocence to be the actual, actually the strongest thing that you can bring to the table as a human being, uh, as opposed to, you know, all the other things that some people bring. Uh, so I, I love that that's what you see in there. I think it was unintentional, but um, I, I think that anytime I create a character like that, I want to spend time with them if they're like that. And so if I want to spend time with them, I'm hoping my readers will feel the same. How does that process work when you first get something down that your agent or an editor starts to kind of dissect it and kind of change it a bit? And how much sway do you say, well, this is kind of the heart of the character. How does that work? It really just depends on the project because right. some of them, um, like with Binky, right? So the crux of the story was there. The concept was there, but my editor thought it was the concept was perhaps a bit too big for a picture book. And, and she does why she suggested expanding it into a 64 page graphic novel. Um, okay. uh, with some things, it's as simple as a drawing I might do for fun. Um, the small Saul book started as a doodle that I did in <laughs> while I was working my day job in my twenties and was real bored. And I drew, <laughs> I drew him um, in a sketchbook and, and just looking as he does, goofy and adorable, but dressed as a pirate. And I thought, <laughs> okay, why would this character be a pirate if he is kind and adorable? You know, why would he be hanging out with these mean guys? And so this whole story about this this character who's too short to join the Navy, but his dream is to sail the high seas. So he goes to pirate college instead. All of that from a drawing. And so that's, you know, something like what I just said there becomes my pitch and like, Okay, what do you think to my editor kind of thing and and if right. they think there's a germ there then and then it expands um sometimes it's as simple as well of um we have a great bookstore up here called kids books there's a few around and uh, you know i've gone in there and said what do parents come in saying we want a book about this and they years ago they said we want fairies like there's everybody wants books about fairies and so i did my research, looked at fairy books, and then played around with a lot of things. I actually had a male fairy character for a long time. Couldn't quite land on what the story was, but then came up with this character that doesn't believe in magic. She believes in science. And mm. what would it? What would the world look like for a fairy surrounded by magic believers? And she's the only one going, no, 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 the scientific method. I'm telling you, it's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I tend to have a lot of characters who do see the world a little differently than everyone else. And like, it's their job to kind of bring everyone around to their point of view. So that's where fairy science came from. Um, and then, and then something as simple as like the Bert, the beetle books. Um, we have these very massive June bugs out here in British Columbia and they're yeah. called 10 line June beetles. And they're about, yeah, they're about yay big. And they're specific to the Pacific Northwest. And so people who would come visit me from other parts of Canada or the US would see them on the street in summer and go, oh, oh my God, right? Because he's just like, <laughs> and they hiss at you and everything. And so I was forever going like, don't worry about them. They don't bite. They don't do anything. In fact, they're like super bad at life. Then I did a little bit of research because I wanted to know like, are they actually, because you know, a lot of bugs have superpowers. And so I did a little right. research and then it just turned out that they were so bad at life. Like other <laughs> bugs can do such cool things and they can't. They're so, and I, I really identified with that because <laughs> I have so many days where I feel like I'm so bad at life. And so the one thing he can bring to the table is his fantastic attitude and his like his cheery, sunny, good nature and his genuine empathy and joy for everyone else who can do cool things. Like he's so excited for them. He's never jealous. He he believes that one day he's going to do something cool. So that whole, you know, again, just like from seeing these random insects on the sidewalk, it turned into this whole thing. Now, this isn't like sit down, come home and write the whole story in an afternoon and it's done. Like the Burt book percolated in the back of my head for about six years before I got there. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes it's there and it, and it takes so many different forms. You know, it's a drawing and a sketchbook. It's a it's a potential synopsis. And then you turn the page and another synopsis, turn the page, another synopsis, and then leave it for a year and come back to it and change the whole thing. And that was the process of Bert. It took a long time to land it, land on the right story and land on the right tone and and um and style and everything for him but i knew that i knew who he was the whole time like i the more right. i wrote it the more i know knew who he was as an individual and so it just 
kind of eventually came so natural to me that like this is this is his journey because this is who he is and then and then some and then other stories um like the most magnificent thing and the most magnificent idea all those ones extremely personal <laughs> very much mm. about my own experiences with the creative process the first book the most magnificent thing actually came to me many many years ago i was trying to create a whole different story that ended up never working. Um, I had a contract to create a book, but the book was unspecified. So I just needed to come up with something. And the, it would, the, the something I was working on was turning into nothing <laughs> very rapidly. And I, I did the super dignified thing and had a major meltdown and cried and curled up in, on the floor and decided that was it. My career had plateaued and it was over. When the cobwebs cleared, I realized that that experience was something that I had seen children go through, in particular when we were doing a drawing exercise in class and their drawing didn't turn out the way that their mind had envisioned it or it didn't turn out exactly like their neighbors or like mine. And I thought, this is actually the story. This is the story mm -hmm. I should be writing about that. How do you how do you persevere when stuff doesn't turn out the way you wanted it to? And and what can you learn from that? So that was where the most magnificent thing came from. And, and it became, it became my biggest book. And that was the yeah. moment where I realized that like, oh, I should, I should write from here and, and my own experience. And that's where you're going to connect most with your readers. So you, you brought up a couple of things. One is that, you know, going to the bookstore and just kind of figuring, Hey, what's, what, what books are people want to read? But then you also talk about stories that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, where have you seen some of your, some of your better ideas coming from places where the stories that mean that are important to you or the ones that you see that kids want to read? I think when it comes from something that I have, I have managed, like I, something that I have battled with and something I've come out the other side. I think that, um, I mean, I'm not by any means going to be <laughs> a wise sage of any kind, but I'd like to think I have a little more experience than a six year old. So, um, I, I, Anytime I can come out of something and go, okay, hey, so when I went through this, this is what helped me. And that's, I think, when I make something that connects with me and makes me feel proud. But it also seems to connect with the kids. Because in those times when I'm writing about those things that were really hard for me, I am being my most vulnerable self. And when you are vulnerable for your readers, they're recognizing that and connecting with that because they are the most vulnerable of all humanity, right? Tiny children. And so we need to, we need to not be telling them what we think we should know. We should be sharing with them what we have worked through mm -hmm. and let them know that I had a vulnerable time and I got through it. So you're feeling vulnerable right now too. That's okay. Cause you're going to get through it too. There's so many clever illustrations you do. And I gotta I just I gotta ask, is like, is there like an overarching like spire verse? Like do you put in little Easter eggs on some of your other books that people might um I don't you... so much. I know I, really? I I mean the one thing that does seem to pop up in every one of my books is there's always a little animal. So there's right. always gonna be some sort of like even if it's not mentioned in the text, very often it is, but um, you know, in the small Saul book, he has a little rat with him the whole time. His little rat's his buddy. And uh, fairy science, of course, she has her little bird. Yeah, everybody always has a little animal friend because I always have a little or six animal yeah. friends around me at any given time. So there's that. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything specific. I do have some some author illustrator friends who who do that. Um, yeah. And I try to a little bit, but I also kind of feel bad because I work with uh, several different publishers. So I also don't want to be like promoting uh, or like sliding in something from like some other book into, you know, I just, I don't know if that's stepping on toes. <laughs> that's true. Because do you have anything, like, how does that work? Does it there, when, when you have a book that's, that, that's with a publisher, is there a certain amount of time where all of a sudden it, the ownership goes back to you or is it hasn't come up yet um okay. only only one did but that was because the publisher it was my very first book and the publisher didn't survive and so you know the rights reverted as a result um but no it hasn't it hasn't come up yet um there i mean i i own nowadays i own the rights for film and television for my my ongoing projects but my earlier work um that wasn't the case just because i don't know back then no one thought their books were going to become cartoons, right? There was not like the content war and desire for it like there is now. So um, def definitely different way of approaching contracts now. So, um, but no, they, I, they're all specific to different um, different publishers. And, you know, I just keep various uh, 
uh, brands or franchises or a series in each in each place. Mm. It's kind of nice. You get to stretch different muscles with different publishers, right? Like some right. publishers want me to be a little bit goofier, and well, they all kind of want me to be goofy. But um, <laughs> some of, some of the, you know you get to sort of tell different stories at different places because it just depends on the editor and what they bring in out, out in you and your work. And so I just um, yeah, I, I like having different avenues for different types of stories I want to tell. And do you see yourself working differently as an illustrator when you're doing one of your own books as compared to doing a book for another mm -hmm. writer? Absolutely. Well, you, you know, it's just it's just like any reader, right? When you when you get given a manuscript, I'm entering that world for the first time and I, I'm I'm seeing it fully formed as opposed to when I'm writing something you know, I see the character first and then I, you know, their world kind of appears to me and I see them walking through it. And it's, it just, when I'm writing the story, it's, it's somewhat simultaneous, whether or not I'm, you know, I'm not just say drawing it at the same time, but I'm seeing the world. So um, it is a very different experience, but an enjoyable one. That said, I'm, I ha I'm putting a little bit of a stop on illustrating for the people only because I have a ton of stories that are kind of like waiting for me. And I, I keep putting them off to illustrate for great authors. And I'm like, wait, I gotta, I gotta do my own stuff now. That's it. Yeah. But it's, um, it's fun because you do get to stretch different illustration muscles when you work um, for other authors, because just like when we read a, a, a story by a different author and we get to visit a different world, it's the same thing for me. I'm visiting a different world and it looks a little different. So I get to try some different things um, as opposed to, like you said, the Spires verse that is like, you know, I, I have a look. <laughs> so, yeah. Are, are you like a pencil on paper kind of person or are you all digital or how does that process work for you now when you actually create your pages? Well, once upon a time, I, I really had a, a big like, you know, never going to work digital, never going to do it. <laughs> and it, and I was very late to the digital game, um, but it was a, a friend of mine in Saskatoon had a Cintiq and was showing it to me. And I was like, oh, oh, OK, this is I could do this, you know, and so that was the game changer for me. But even then, you know, I've only been uh, working that way for. Well, actually, the most magnificent thing was the first book that I illustrated digitally. Oh, okay. Completely, yeah. So that was two thousand. That was ten years ago. Yeah, I've, just, I've been working digitally for the most part since then. So before then, I was working watercolor. I did all the Binky books with by hand watercolor. Terrible idea. Don't do a sixty-four graphic no, page graphic novel because you're going to have consistency errors. And when you've done it with watercolor, what are you going to do anyway? Um, <laughs> so um, I do. I still do a lot of character sketching in sketchbooks because there's just something about sitting at the kitchen table and with a cup of tea and drawing characters that seems to make it go easier. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but after that, I, I do most of, and thumb and thumbing. I do thumb on paper still because I'd like to have it next to me on the, when I finally get down to the Cintiq and it's there and I can kind of, kind of go off that. But um, otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm strictly digital. It's very convenient as well. I live, so I live in BC. Most of my publishers are either, you know, most of them are Toronto, but also New York. It's, you know, years and years of packaging up your artwork and sending it off. And then they're paying for, it's just, life is so much easier when it's digital. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, so that's, I predominantly work that way now. It's uh, and just in Photoshop. I'm, I'm not, I wish I was a tech wizard, but I still feel like I'm learning so much and, and I have a long, long way to go still, but it's fun. But, th but that's a good point. You said you, you when you, you kind of like create, you kind of sketch out some, do you script out the thing and, and then actually create thumbnails or are you tell a story through thumbnails first and then kind of like fill in the words after? How does that process work? I'm you? definitely a words per first kind of person. Um, okay. Like I said, there might be a character sketch that pops in and there, there will definitely be like heavy illustration notes in my manuscripts or my drafts because, you know, I'm, I've been doing this enough to know that, you know, I'm going to say this, but then in the image, you're going to see, see this happen. And that contradiction is where you get the humor or, or furthers the story in some way. So um, there's lots of illustration notes, like, you know, this character does this, walks into this room or, you know, but I don't, I don't actually start drawing it until the manuscript is pretty much locked because, um, as soon as I start drawing it, then, then that can become locked in my head visually. And so I want to leave it as open visually to myself as possible. And the best way to do that is to just refine the words to the point where they need to be, where they're as refined as possible. And then and then I move over to, to visuals. Yeah. Okay. What piece of, of skill or advice that you wished you knew when you first started uh, writing and illustrating? Well, there's a few different things. Um, 
I think one of the things would have been, yeah, to, to maybe not worry so much about trying to give the world what you think they need to read, but instead write the stories that you need to tell, if that makes oh, any sense. That's a good so, one. um, and I still struggle with that because, you know, we all want a New York Times bestseller, but there's no way to control that. We have no yeah. control over how the how any of your books are ever going to get received in the world. But the thing you can control is the story that you're telling and its importance to you. That's, I think, the thing that I wish I had known because for years you're chasing the awards, you're chasing the accolades, you're chasing all these things. It's, it's a fool's errand right there, right? You have to just be creating for yourself. And I think, again, that the heart that goes into your work is what's going to connect with your readers. And then the other thing that I wish people uh, would talk about a little bit more, or at least was a bigger part of my early education, um, what would be something as simple and dirty as contract reading. Like just mm. how do you protect your IP? How do you uh, prevent being taken advantage of, which is so common with creatives in particular, young creatives. And, um, it's so exciting. The first time someone says, Hey, we want to pay you to do something. And you don't know that you're getting paid peanuts for it, or you don't know that you've just signed away those rights. And so I, you know, I, I would love for there to be more education and more transparency in our industry about what is industry. I think there should be an industry standard of what people get paid for the work because it's a lot of work to illustrate a book. And no matter what country you're in, it's it's a lot. And and we earn that we earn that money. And um, and people, you know, in Canada, sometimes your advances can start at uh, three thousand mm. dollars Canadian for a twenty four page picture book. Like that's that's peanuts, right? Yeah, like you, you are having a day job. There's no way you can live off that. So I would, I would like to help creatives, um, or like create a sort of, like I said, an industry standard at some point, or at least how to stand up for yourself and say, Hey, I know I'm worth it. <laughs> you can pay me more. Um, right. so yeah, I think that side of things, I wish I had known more about. I mean, cause you bring up a good point. Cause it's like you said, there's a business aspect to it. Mm -hmm. That's extremely important. And um, yeah. How important do you see like like art schools being able to actually make may, may almost mandate business classes for for folks that are going into the visual? Arts? I mean, I think it's I think it's absolutely invaluable. So I had I had both experiences. So I went to art school here in British Columbia, a fine art school, Emily Carr. It's, it's amazing. It was an amazing experience. It was where I decided I wanted to write and illustrate children's books. It was wonderful, but it was very much a liberal arts education without that component. And again, we're talking about like, you know, late nineties, uh, you know, that, so I'm sure a lot of that has changed, I hope anyway. Um, but yeah, not really a whole lot of talk about the business side of things about how do you make a living? How do you make sure to protect your, your moral rights to things and, and your IP and, and the rest of it. And then, um, when I decided I was going to do this, I got a couple jobs and then I went to Sheridan in Toronto. And at the time they had a one year program for people who had a degree already. And, um, so it was a very intense, amazing course. And it had business classes in it and it had people saying, here's what a contract should look like. Here are things you absolutely need to avoid. And that was that was like mind blowing. And also just like this is what all artists need, no matter what your job is. It, we need that because the whole world is is created by artists and how many but how many creatives have had have been taken advantage of because right. That's just unfortunately the way the world works is that we are our, our work is very often not valued until it reaches a certain point, right? Um, I think it I think it should be mandatory, and it's definitely something as you know as I get um, a little bit on in years, <laughs> I I'm I'm quite passionate, and I hope I have an opportunity to actually go back to university and and impart some of that, like go to a university and talk to the students and talk to them about the importance of this. Not that I have massive business knowledge in it by any means, but just really talk about how I know it's a pain to pay $500 to a lawyer to look at your contract when you're only getting paid $5,000. But <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen with that book. You don't know what's going to happen down the road, what rights you've just written off. You know, you have to do it. And if enough people did it too, then maybe a lot of publishers wouldn't try. Not that I'm saying I work with great publishers up here, but some of the smaller ones, you know, they cut corners and they try things and it's really important to, to protect yourself. Right. Where do you see children's books 
um, in the industry in the next 10 years? So the thing about children's books, I, they are, they are enduring, right? They are because while all the technology in the world will change, kids don't, kids want to hold a book. You know, I remember years ago when they talked about, uh, you know, everything moving to Kindles and, and, oh no, it's a death of children's books -uh, because no one's going to hand their kid a Kindle, right? No one's going to hand their two-year-old <laughs> something they can smash. You're going to give them a book and yes, they might tear the pages, but that's part of the, you know, they, and they also need to hold something and they want to look at it over and over and over again. So I think books themselves are going to survive. Um, I hope that indie, indie bookstores will survive with them because I have great indie bookstores where I live um, and being able to walk in there and say, what, what do you recommend? I have a kid. I don't know how many times I'm in a bookstore. And that seems to be the most common thing. Someone walks in and says, I know this kid, reluctant reader, but really loves robots. What do you got? You know, and so we need those indie bookstores with those people who are like, perfect, here we go. You want this graphic novel that's about this and this and this, you know? Um, so I think that that's important. I do think that... Um, Never before has our industry been mined for content like now, right? It's, mm. it's wild. In fact, um, a, a friend of mine is an actress and um, she has a story idea she wanted to pitch as a, as you know, an actual television series. And they said to her, um, write it as a book first, mm. which I was like, wow, look at that. That's how it works. They want the numbers from your book in order to approve to go to the next stage or at least that it's there which is actually great for us because it gives you a lot more control over the creative control over something if it's pre-existing in our art form before it moves to the before it moves to film or television um so i think that that's that's where our our industry is heading i hope that it doesn't mean that people start to create things thinking this will make a great movie um but i honestly think what book would make a great movie that's we've it's all there, right? So, right. yeah, I think that's that's where it's headed. Um, there's the the people coming up behind me always blow me away with their originality and their creativity and their talent. And so I I don't know that I'm capable of seeing what's coming in the next ten years. I'm just excited to see it. <laughs> so that yeah, so so we're talking about the future, but I'm also kind of curious about what were some of your favorite books that you liked reading growing up. Uh, well, again, wasn't quite the variety that we have now, right? <laughs> but um, my friend, my, my very, very close friend, still a very close friend of mine, her mom was a children's book uh, librarian. So I totally had an in. And she was the one who gave me Roald Dahl's Revolting Rhymes when I was, I don't know, nine or 10. And it blew my mind because it was so dark and it was so dry and it was so funny. And I was like, yes, yes to all of this. <laughs> And I didn't even know that was possible. So I, I cons massively consumed all of his work. But Revolting Rhymes still remains my absolute favorite because it's just so audaciously terrible. <laughs> I, love it. I love it so much. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was a favorite. Um, I'm trying to think of things that I read when I was very small. I mean, again, it would be like you know, um, Harold and the Purple Crayon and uh, um, the Harry books, the dog with the sweater. I love that. Oh yeah. yeah. Anytime yeah. there was a dog or like an animal that like helped another animal, I was, I was in, I was in for that. Um, right. Yeah. Those, those are, those are, you know, again, I wish that I had more. Now I could go on and on and on about the book, kids books that I read now that I just, that blow me away, but there wasn't quite right. as many, but Roald, Roald Dahl, I loved his tone. I loved his dryness. I loved that he um, didn't talk down to kids, that he spoke to them in a way that, made them come up to him and i think that that's personally i think it's very important with um any form of writing for children because they they will absorb the word from context and i think we like very often we can get bogged down with oh this is a word they won't know well this is how they learn it <laughs> you put it in the book <laughs> and uh and as opposed to yeah worrying about they won't they won't get it they will yeah. yeah, they're going to read it five times too. So they'll read it. They'll, they might not know it for the first three, but they will for the last two. It'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's been fantastic. And I'm so excited to, uh, I'm so excited to let my daughters know that we talked to Ashley Spires tonight. Oh, so, yeah. Thank you. I'm so glad that they read my books. I'm so glad they enjoy it. That's really wonderful. So, yeah. there will be more, there'll be more to come. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yes. Of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
I know. We weird? remember the 90s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is why when the styles came back, I'm like, no, 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 we're no. good. We did this. We're good. We don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was bad the first time round. Why are we doing it again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh.